It's the Bottom Line podcast here on the Blood Red Channel. I'm Guy Clark. Welcome along with a new contract for Mohamed Salah still unsigned. The Premier League title race slipping from Liverpool's grasp and a new year upon us. I'm joined by our business of football writer Dave Powell as ever, as well as our Liverpool correspondent Paul Gorse to talk through on-field and off-field objectives for 2022. Gents, I trust you're both well. And uh, well, Dave, I'll throw over to, to you first. And I suppose, as ever, new year upon us. It will be a case of FSG and those in the high ups at Liverpool drawing up a, a list of what they want to achieve in, in the next 12 months. Yeah, and I think that the... the, the direction of the football club has always been to be build it as a as a business and the business under underpins success and investment and, and that's likely going to continue through 2022 we've already seen back end of 21 um the addition of the pittsburgh penguins to the the fsg empire um we've had commercial deals signed which will greatly benefit the football club moving forward over the past you know 12 months or so they've been inked so it's going to be another case of I think 2022 is going to be a year when some of that capital which arrived from Redbird and uh, that we've spoken at, at length previously um, might start to kick in for FSG as a, as a whole. I know that when it first arrived, people were hoping that that kind of capital would be used to prop up um, transfer spend um, and, and kind of mitigate some of the, the issues caused by the pandemic. But, you know, ultimately, capital in FSG's case, arrives for business growth. I mean, that's what it's there for. I mean, if it, it's very rare you'd get investors who are, who are seeking some kind of return, um, plowing it into the transfer budget because there's no, you know, it's far less guarantees about receiving some kind of return over that. So I, I imagine it's going to be the growth of the business, um, which I you know we, it's kind of a, a longer route back to that money filtering back to Liverpool. But ultimately, that's um, that's been the strategy from day one. And, and I know it, it, it's kind of reached a bit of a, a sharp point at the moment because there's there's so much that people want to see done over, you know, most Salah's contract and transfer business in the summer, which, you know, which Paul will, will talk about. But um, it's going to be a year of, of, of growth, I think, and not just for adding new teams, which I think they will um look at new markets, including football, I think it'll be a case of they'll invest in more diverse businesses. I mean, we've already seen them invest along with Redbird and Nike in LeBron James's company. And I expect more of that kind of work will will, will go on um, and the company will, will try and grow itself. Coming out of a pandemic um, and, and kind of re, really strengthen its position in the marketplace. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk then about priority number one, I suppose, Gorsty. We've spoken about it at length on the Blood Red podcast. You asked even Jürgen Klopp about it in the, the press conference last mm. week, but surely has to be that, that new contract for Mohamed Salah. Oh, 100%. Um, I think I wrote as well in the Blood Red column this week that um, when he gets back from Cameroon with Egypt and the Africa Cup of Nations, that they've got to kind of move that up the priority list. Um I thought it was a little bit mischievous from um, Rami Abbas, who's obviously Mohamed Salah's representative, um, one day this week, just kind of saying hello to um, Fabrizio Romano, who I think all of us know is the kind of transfer journalist, if you like. He, he's obviously made his name off the back of reporting transfers left, right and centre. And that was a little bit of a um, little bit of a nudge, wasn't it? Set fans <clears throat> talking about it and, and whatever else. And perhaps there is a little bit of... Um, Maybe not frustration, but um, kind of feeling along those lines that this is dragging on within Salah's camp. <clears throat> he obviously spoke to GQ magazine, didn't he, which was an interview recorded before Christmas. Uh, and he basically knocked the ball back across the court once again and basically made it known that he wants to stay and he's not asking for crazy stuff, as, as his words were reported. And <clears throat> look, Liverpool, or rather FSG, have, uh, or the administrators, as, as Salah calls them, have... Got to get this done, haven't they? Um, <clears throat> how much would it take to replace a player of, of Mohamed Salah's quality right now? Uh, there's no guarantees that whoever you're bringing in, they're going to be able to do the business on the pitch as well as he's doing at the moment. Um, there probably only maybe one, two or three players, if you'd even think, that could do a similar job as to what he's doing for Liverpool now. And they're probably going to cost more than what it would be to keep Salah down to a, let's say, £350,000 a week contract. Um, just kind of bashed out the sums there as Dave was talking and I think if he was to receive that sum over five years I think it comes in at 84 million pounds and um, <clears throat> a player of, of Salah's quality is what would probably worth double that in this market at least so um, 
Well, you'd at least have to pay that on a transfer fee, wouldn't you? Well, exactly, yeah, that, that's it, isn't it? So, um, look, he, he's, he's 29, and I can understand maybe there's some hesitancy from the Liverpool camp that, um, you know, he's getting towards that 30 mark, and the general kind of conventional wisdom of football is the players kind of tail off in the 30s, but I look around world football now, and some of the biggest names in European football are, are in the mid-30s, still doing the business. Lewandowski's just won the, the, the best men's player of the year award, hasn't he? Um He's 33, is he? <clears throat> Lionel Messi's still going at 34. Cristiano Ronaldo at 36. Zlatan Ibrahimovic at AC Milan is 40. Um, so I think generally now um, footballers will have to themselves a lot better than they did 15, 20 years ago when they can play for longer and they can manage the, the minutes accordingly. And Salah for me has still got easily three, four years <clears throat> at a similar level to what he's at now. So it's a no-brainer, isn't it, from the outside looking in? But obviously, <clears throat> FSG have got to look at the sums a little bit more diligently than we do. And fans just saying, give him what he wants. That is, you know, pie in the sky, unfortunately. But um, one way or another, this is a deal that has to get done. Yeah, Dave, you're the man who looks at the balance sheets for us. How far can FSG stretch? Of course, I would imagine any new contract would make him the most expensive contract that, that Liverpool have ever sanctioned. But... I mean, how far can they go? Of course, you're saying there, obviously, what we see on the pitch, he is vital to what Liverpool want to achieve. In theory, I mean, it's a deal they can get done. I mean, it's uh, they, they're they never close to breaching any kind of financial fair play regulations. Um, I think the question for them more is what it, it creates longer term in terms of, uh, I mean, they just negotiated a whole host of new, new contracts with major players and I imagine sellers' um, demands will be you know, quite some some way ahead of, of those, uh, and I understand. I mean, forwards are always you know the the most costly uh, to sign to keep, um, so so that makes sense. But I think it's a case of do they are they concerned that it will uh, kind of shift their wage structure uh, that they've had so carefully in place? I mean, Jurgen Klopp always likes to work with a small squad, doesn't it? And um, that. You know they don't have a host of um, superstars on mega money um, sitting on the fringes doing not an awful lot. Everyone's a contributor, so all that will play play into their thinking. But it's something that you know they don't. They're not a, a club which has FFP issues because they've been in profit for the past couple of years by considerable amounts. Um, but I think that'll be a, a major concern for them. But as Paul says, if um, Salah was to go, um, the market for a player. Of, of his age, I suppose, at the moment is, is slightly depressed coming out of the pandemic, even though he's a you know he's a stellar performer. But they'd also have to pay uh, an enormous premium to replace him in transfer fees. And they're not going to be able to s- sign anyone with uh, who, who will be demanding much less than, than what he would be in this current market at that level he's operating. So um, it makes financial sense to actually actually keep him, I think. And also in the in the short term, um, it, they, 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 they're arriving at this into this year, um, still, you know, needing to make up some s- some ground over the issues they had with the Super League and lost a lot of trust there. And I know they've tried to do some to build it back with um, with what they've done with with Spirit of Shankly, etc. But um, I think it's a, a case of short term. They need some success, and the best way of achieving that success and um, it is by keeping your best players. And Mohamed Salah is, you know, we, we talked about it previously at the moment, he's, he's arguably, you know, the best forward player in the world. Um, so why you would uh, risk that, um, I'm, I'm not too sure. Also, he's commercially valuable to the football club. He's a, um, you know, Liverpool have, I'd say, two of the most valuable um, African footballers on the planet within uh, in, in their ranks. And that plays into... Um, them helping them tap into an enormous commercial market, um, as well as you know Mohammed, Mohammed Salah's most prominent Muslim footballer, um, and all this opens Liverpool up to, to kind of huge demographics and markets, and makes them enormously appealing to, to commercial partners. So um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not speaking to it from from a point of view of, um, of, of knowing what's going to happen, but I, I'd imagine that you know they they will know themselves that um, it, it's something that they can. You know they need to do, but like any business, I mean, they want to get the best price for for what they're paying. Um, but ultimately, as as Paul will probably attest to, it's that window is is, is closing, and the longer it goes on, the the more doubt is cast. Yeah, definitely. I suppose 
the kind of last point on it, Gorsi, Steve, is if it gets into that last year, then all of a sudden there is more power, surely, with Mohamed Salah. Liverpool need to get this wrapped up soon. Yeah, if it, if it gets to that point, I think it'd be absolute panic stations, wouldn't it, from, from within the club? Um, because um, if Salah can speak to teams outside of England, um, he's, he's not going to join another club in England. Um, there's absolutely no way he moves to Manchester City, and I don't think anyone else could afford him. Um, couldn't see him going back to Chelsea, certainly. So if he is able to speak to teams outside of England, that is when you, you are getting worried from a Liverpool perspective because um, he's going to have them all after him, isn't he? <clears throat> um, whether or not he feels that um, you know other clubs are able to match his kind of sport and ambition, I don't know. But certainly <clears throat> that is a, a scenario that Liverpool absolutely do not want in <clears throat> in any in any case. So, um, yeah, it's just, just like we keep saying, it, it's something that, that has to be resolved um, sooner or later, um, sooner rather than later, I'd, I'd suggest. And, um, it's almost become a bit of a, a side issue as well, you know, while, while it's been going on. The Jurgen Klopp's obviously field done a lot of questions about it. Salah's getting asked about it every time he, he speaks. And I think it's been interesting to note that um, Salah is usually a player who doesn't do too much talking in public. Um, if you've ever stood in a mix zone around field and, and he walks past you, he, he just kind of politely declines. And he's only ever spoken twice uh, in a mix zone. Once was after he promised journalists, um, once he got to the 40 goal mark in his first season, that he'd stop. And he did. Um, he made good on that promise. And the other one was after they won the Champions League. Um, other than that, he just kind of politely waves it away and, and um, walks away. So when he speaks, it's normally because he's got something to say. And I um, thought it was fascinating that he was the, the cover. Um, cover star of GQ this month or for February rather because they uh, kind of suggest that they're looking to, to grow the, the Salah brand into even more areas and they've mentioned there about him being you know one of the most well-known um, idolised African footballers you know on that continent and um, you know so a, a poster boy for, for, for Muslims and, and athletes in, in that area of the world and he's just growing into an absolute superstar hasn't he and, and um, Liverpool I've always been keen to allow that to happen, to be fair to them. They've, they've never looked to try and dampen that down. And, and if Salah wants to speak to to whoever it may be, they're, they're happy to, to let him do that, such as AS in, in December, what was it, 2019, was it? Or, or 2020, sorry, when he kind of got asked the question of Real Madrid and Barcelona. Um, and th- those types of questions are, are, are going to keep coming as long as uh, the situation remains as it is. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's just got to be one of the high priorities for Michael Edwards and, and his team in, in the final few months of, of his tenure at the club. Yeah, after listening to, to the two of you, I'm scratching my head as to, to why Liverpool haven't sanctioned something already. But Gorsi, I'll stay with you. And Okay, we spoke there about retention of Mohamed Salah. What about recruitment then in the summer? Liverpool's squad may be ageing somewhat. The midfield certainly having been battered and bruised through the course of, of this season. Yeah. And as we say, at the top end of the pitch, it isn't just Salah. There are, are contract issues with both Mane and, and Firmino as well that are unresolved. Do you expect maybe that this would be a busier summer for Liverpool or, or how do you see it? Yeah, I think, I think it has to be, doesn't it? I think, you know, for a club who prided themselves on long-term strategic planning, the you know, looking ahead and it might be a bit of a storm approaching if they don't get one or two things right early. Because, uh, as you mentioned there about Mane and um, Firmino and Oxley chamberlains in a similar boat, and, and obviously the big one is Salah. At a time when the squad's been together for the last four years, it's largely been the same squad. Liverpool haven't spent too much in the way of kind of replenishing that squad. They've obviously brought in Jota and Thiago in 2020 for a combined fee of about £70 million, which is not um, it's not small change, but it's not a massive amount of money for a club of their size when you think... City and Chelsea and you know and even United. United spent more than that on bringing in Sancho and obviously Lukaku and Grealish cost more than that. And then Canate came in again for um, you know a figure that you you don't shrug at, but it's not um, wasn't a huge fee. Was a thirty six million in this day and age. Minamino was was a bit of a opportunistic seven million. You know, found out about the release clause in his contract and brought him to the club and. Those really the only and Simakash, what was he, 10, 11 million? They're the only five players that Liverpool have brought in to the first team level in the last four years. Um so it's largely been the same squad. Um and I think 
at some point you do have to start seriously thinking about kind of replenishing it and refreshing it. And um, I think the summer of 2022 could be the time to do that. I don't think there's any great need to rip her up and start again. I think Liverpool have got the nucleus of a really top squad, top team, arguably the strongest 11 in the Premier League when everyone's fit. But it, it is probably is that caveat of when everyone's fit, isn't it? You know, Thiago doesn't play nearly enough as the Liverpool fans want him to, and £50 million Naby Keita is in the, the same boat. And um, James Milner is 36 this month, I think. So, yeah, I think now, you know, as I say, Liverpool looking ahead to the, you know, sort of June, July months, if um, they're not proactive now, then they might be running into a bit of trouble further down the line, which... Um, would be very unlike Liverpool and certainly the way Liverpool have, have operated in, in the Klopp era. Yeah, come the summer, Dave, it'll be, what, four and a half years since Van Dijk and, and four years that summer since Fabinho and, and Alison Becker were all brought to the club. So in terms of balance sheets and how these these payments are always spread out over kind of that, that first contract cycle of a player, are, are those kind of fees coming off of the, the balance sheets now? Where are we in terms of if FSG feel as though they are maybe freeing up some some cash. And I suppose most people listening and watching are thinking, you've said before that they run on profitability a lot of the time. Surely there's one year where they take the hit, go into the red, knowing that they, they kind of future-proof themselves for staying at the level they're at. Yeah, and I, I do wonder whether some of this, um, the contract business, which has already been done, um, is kind of a precursor to some summer business because ultimately what that's done is, reduced amortization payments that they've been had on the balance sheet for, for some time, which is the price, of the, you know, the, the cost of the transfer fee initially uh, over the length of the contract. And and once you extend a player's contract, that becomes less and less and less uh, on, on the balance sheet. So um, that will come down this this, this year uh, or the next set of accounts. Um, probably given all the contract business happened last summer it's probably going to be 2022 before that is seen but obviously they're working 12 months ahead with this um so that will come down um and, and they are they're probably in that they are in a position to to spend but as as we've seen previously it's um they're, they're more meticulous about finding the right people for the you know to, to do the job um so it there, there will be the ability for them to do it i know we've seen you know much about made about players like Jude Bellingham, you wonder FSG's longer term strategy has always been about having uh, a squad which isn't stacked with so many you know, older players. That And that's replicated through whether it's the Boston Red Sox, whether it's Liverpool. There, there has always been a need to kind of freshen up uh, as you go along. But obviously football is very different than baseball. You, there isn't the, uh, the accepted season every now and again where you will tank a season uh, in order to rejuvenate your squad Liverpool have to operate at a high level consistently and there's no there's no room for a drop off so there will have to be a you know sustained success but also they will have to acknowledge the fact that they need to invest in in, in kind of world class youth talent that's coming through as well i know they have a wonderful you know youth setup and we've already seen the likes of Kate Gordon and and and, um, and and Tyler Morton and players making a breakthrough this season but it's having those young players who are 21, 22, 23, who are already operating just under that world-class level. Because and, and, and there aren't many around like that. I mean, Jude Bellingham ticks that box. And I suppose central midfield is an area where um, there are more kind of ageing bodies um, than than elsewhere in the squad with, with, with James Milner and Anna Henderson and uh, Thiago. Um so maybe that is. I think if if they were to make a big sign, in it does feel like it would be someone who would like Canate was almost. It's uh, has age on their side. It's hard to imagine that they'd be signing anyone over the age of twenty five um, in in this next cycle if they make a big move. I just think it that they have to acknowledge that they have to look at the longer term plan, um, but also be able to compete at the very highest level. Yeah, definitely. It does feel like that, doesn't it, Gorstein? You kind of look at it as well, I suppose, backstage. Michael Edwards, you've already mentioned him moving on, and Julian Ward coming in. May well be a need for Liverpool to spend and do a bit in the summer, but equally, the, the, the recruitment team is going to be undergoing somewhat of a change. Yeah, it is. But I think I think the important thing from Liverpool's perspective is it's kind of a, a bit of a culture in terms of how they operate. Um, it's not something that, um, you know, swapping one 
person for another in a particular role who's going to rip the blueprint up and see them completely start again. It, I think um, I suppose it's it's almost kind of the old school boot room reimagined, yeah, yeah. but for recruitment, isn't it? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, Julian Ward, he's, he's been at Liverpool for years, to be fair, and he's another one who's kind of risen through the ranks. And in a similar way that Pep Linders has on the coaching side of things, he started, you know, coaching the under-15s, I think, and then slowly worked his way up. And now he'll be taking the uh, the press conference this afternoon for the Carabao Cup semi-final. Julian Ward is someone who is uh, hugely regarded within the within the club. Um, he's worked as a, as a scout at Manchester City before, you know, covering their... Portuguese players who they were looking at, and you know, as I say, he's been at Liverpool for a long time. So I think, I think it's around about a decade now, actually. And um, his influence and, and stature has, has only grown at Liverpool. You know, we became Liverpool's first ever assistant sporting director on. Um, well, it was announced. I think it was announced on Christmas Eve, actually, 2020. Um, and he's obviously been shadowing Michael Edwards very closely over the last year or so. Um, I was down at Stamford Bridge in October for. The, uh, the stats bomb events and, and Liverpool's recruitment team were there and, and those two were front and centre, you know, kind of absorbing everything that was getting said from, you know, the, the, the panels. And um, it just seems to be a, a a culture within the recruitment team, as I say, with, with the director of research, Ian Graham, and, and his team. And um, there is that very, you know, that big idea within the club that it's all joined up thinking and, um, you know, replacing one for another doesn't mean a complete 180 in terms of focus and style and ideas. Um, so that will hold Liverpool in good stead. But um, there's no doubt that replacing someone of, you know, the, the stature that Michael Edwards has within the game um, and football fans who, or Liverpool fans who kind of worship him as this kind of mythical figure. Don't think they don't see too much of what he does other than the players he's brought in and, and they speak for themselves. So, yeah, um, big shoes to fill. But um, I imagine Liverpool will be confident that... Um, Julian Moore can do that, but it's uh, probably a big summer for him to be to be doing that, isn't it? It's not like one where he's come in and it's a quiet one and Liverpool are just getting the ducks in a row and, and and continuity is the key like it was last summer. I think the summer of 2022 will be a, um, a significant one. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that succession does play out. Before we go then, let's wrap up and rattle through kind of any other business that is going on and the ideas for 2022 for Liverpool and uh, Dave I'll throw over to you in terms of commercially then what are the big opportunities out there for Liverpool to be looking at I suppose as they they look to try and get revenue streams really back fully firing on all cylinders off the back of the pandemic well it, they're gonna have to um, make a, a key appointment soon with, with Matt Scammell to, to go to Formula E um, but there is it, it's just we're in, we're in a strange marketplace at the moment with football because there's so many emerging commercial streams come online, so crypto and NFTs and everything. And, and the impression I got um, from having spoken to, to Matt last year was that that was an area which Liverpool had some reluctance to, to really go too headstrong into, um, especially given the fact that how some of these kind of, you know, socios and things like that have been perceived in terms of monetizing fan engagement. So I, I think Liverpool will be more cautious. I know they have some kind of tentative link-ups with with, with crypto firms um, somewhere in their partnerships, but it, not, they haven't really gone as strong in it as some, you know, you look at Inter, I mean, basically they've, they, you know, they've turned into a, a kind of a digitised football club. It's um, uh, So I don't, I don't see uh, Liverpool being so headstrong in finding the inroads into that market. I mean, it, it's a, it's an unregulated market, has a lot, of, a lot of questions over it at the moment. And I think in Spain, that's starting to get rained back a little bit. So, but I do think... Um, Kind of things like digital technology, so VR and, and trying to explore experiences for supporters around the world. You know, so virtual experiences where they can kind of virtually kind of uh, experience a Liverpool match day and and all that comes with it. I think those type of things, um, because I know Redbird have previously been keen on, on on exploring that kind of technology with some of their investments. I imagine some of that might dovetail in terms of uh, what they do with FSG and and how the Red Sox and, and, and Liverpool are both are both utilised within that. But it's Liverpool that have the global appeal. It's not, you know, Red Sox are an enormously storied franchise in America, but it's, you know, outside of America, maybe in the in the UK, I mean, baseball fans take them into their hearts, some of them. But I think it, with Liverpool, it is a truly global brand and they know the, the value of that. 
Um, they'll also, also grow in the pie for FSG in terms of uh, adding new teams to the uh, to the mix. I mean, they've already done it with the Penguins. I'm, I expect this year they'll add another team. I mean, the the noises seem to be an NBA franchise. I mean, Sam Kennedy, who's an FSG partner, has spoken about that previously, that it's a, a market where the valuation of the teams uh, in the bottom half are still uh, uh, relatively affordable uh it's hard to imagine you know you look at the new york knicks these things don't stack up i mean the most valuable franchise in the nba they're worth about five billion but they they're one of the most unsuccessful teams in nba uh recent history so fsg will be trying to find that almost that they did with the pittsburgh penguins um i think this boston celtics while they may like to add a team like that to their roster may uh may be a bit cost prohibitive um but getting the First and foremost, so with, with Liverpool, they've got to get uh, you know a strong commercial um, replacement for for Matt Scammell and then move forward with that. I mean, they've already hired uh, Michael Higgin from uh, he's come from Rock Nation, but previously he was um, at Sevilla as their sponsorships director. He's come in as um, I think he's uh, head of uh, global partnerships or sponsorships. I think I can't remember his full title at Liverpool now, but uh, he will be working alongside a commercial manager and and, and that relationship, I think. Links back to um, the preseason tour, which was 20, 2019, I think, if I'm if I'm right. When they went, said they played Sevilla at Fenway. I mean, um, Michael Higgins was in charge of leading that uh, commercially that preseason tour for Sevilla, and Liverpool played Sevilla at Fenway. So you wonder whether those kind of talks happen uh, ahead of time. But it's it's a key it's a key appointment for them. This whoever comes in next, because this is a big year. They have to grow the pie. They have to grow the revenue streams. And for Liverpool, it's more key than most. Um, to have strong revenue streams, um, especially at a time when Manchester City, I know previously the, the two things never married up. I mean, there, there was heavy spend and uh, success, but the revenue streams were still tagging behind the rest. But now with, um, you know, there's been, I know a lot of their business is done with the UAE and related parties. I mean, they kept the arm's length transactions, but it, it's helped them to, to grow their own revenue streams to be, you know, one of the biggest in the Premier League now. So that's, Another problem that we'll have to contend with. The Nike deal helps. I mean, we'll see the continue to see the benefit of that. I think Liverpool and Nike will work on more projects together. Uh, I think LeBron James and Liverpool will work on more projects together to open Liverpool out to different demographics in especially in the US. People who aren't necessarily interested in football. So there's so many things that they have on their their table at the moment. I think last year was about getting a lot of things in line. And I think this year you'll start to see a few of those executed. Um but how it all comes back and, and, and how much of the, uh, the the funding comes back into the transfer kitty will be the you know the the thing on everyone's lips. Uh, that might not be something which happens immediately, but um, further on down the line, the more money Liverpool make from commercial revenue, it goes hand in hand with how much money they're able to spend in the transfer market and the less reliance they have on player trading. Your is pricked up there, Gorsley, didn't they? A, a potential pre-season tour of America. Obviously, there's not been one for a couple of years. But, hey, you, you've had to deal with empty stadiums for uh, a full season last year. It'd be nice to have a, a little break, wouldn't it, before the start of the next season? It would, yeah. I'm, I'm yet to, to actually take on as the, as the Liverpool correspondent at the Echo because it, it was announced before uh, or after the tour in 2019 and obviously 2020, there wasn't one, was there? So, um, yeah, it would be nice to to maybe get to the US and see a few of the uh, the stadiums there. But I think um, I, I think these commercial activities are a massive priority for, for these types of clubs, and, and they have been for the best part of twenty years now. Let, let's face it, um, you know the, the clubs kind of paint it a little bit as getting to see the you know the fan base who don't have the opportunity to get across as regularly as as they'd like to, and that is a part of it. But you know the Line share of the reason they, they do these is for the commercial um, boost that gives the clubs um, playing glamorous friendlies in whether it's America or, or the Far East or down under. They've been um, been huge for the likes of Liverpool, City, United, Chelsea for for years, um, and no doubt if, if Liverpool are given the green light to, to do that in you know, you know this summer, this coming summer, then that was something that they'd love to take advantage of. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, Possibly something that, that that's in the thinking of, of the Liverpool hierarchy at the moment, and um, we shall see what plan to come up with in the coming weeks and months. Um, I do think they, they tend to 
prefer the American legs rather than the, the, the Far East Tour. I think they went there in 2017 and there was a monsoon. It completely rained out a couple of, of days training and I think they had to work indoors in a, in a gym one afternoon because the weather was so bad and I don't think the pitches are in a particularly good state as a result of that as well and it can lead to injuries. So from the, from the football side of things, I think if you're going to ask Jürgen Klopp, he'd tell you that he'd, he'd love a week or rather a month in, in Austria and, and a few days in Evian. But um, if he does have to sign up for a global tour, then um, I think the United States is probably going to be the one that wins out there. But they will, will know more, a bit more about that than me, I guess, and, and we shall uh, see what they come up with in, in the next few months, if it's possible. Yeah, let's wait and see how things do play out. Well, that's it from us here then on the bottom line, whether it's off-field or on-field activities, stay glued to the Liverpool Echo website. Brilliant writing from both Dave and Paul, as well as what we have on offer here for you on the Blood Red channel. But from myself, Guy Park, Paul Gorst and Dave Powell, thanks for your time and your company. It's bye.